So, another episode of Cork in and our podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to everyone that's uh, been liking. Sharing has dropped off. All right, start sharing again. Start telling people about it, right? Please do keep downloading and stuff like that. We do appreciate it. We've got some exciting news coming up pretty soon. We've got another live show. And there's also a secret work in progress gig with myself, Shane Todd, and Aaron Butler that will be going out only to the patrons. It may have even sold out by now. Who, who knows? But you've got to be a patron to figure it, to find out. Now, before we crack on with this week's episode, two things I'm going to mention to you. Number one, the Die-In Pub are the sponsors of this podcast. They're fans of us and we're fans of them. And we all know if you want to go for a bit of food, you want to have a drink, you go down to the Doy Inn on the Lisburn Road, refurbished many years ago, still a good standard, right? Still a good toilet, unbelievable. Disabled one, spotless. How do I know? Had a quick look, right? Staff attentive. Salt and pepper on the table along with cutlery. What more do you need? 25% off your food Wednesday to Saturday if you use the code CORK25. Book a table. Take the mother out. Take the girlfriend out. Take the family out. You say, we've never been to this place before. We're going to go in. I get 25% off because we follow, we follow, we follow the Cork and our podcast. You go in, you go Cork 25, please. 25%. Not just your food. Every single person at the table. If there's 10 of you at the table, 10 of you get 25% off your food. Okay. Cork 25, the die in, check out for live events. Go down there to watch rugby. Go down there to watch football. Loads of comedy events and stuff like that. So please do support the die in pub because they are supporting us. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, joining me this week on Cork in the North Podcast is a man walked into the building, turned up with these Southern Tato, Southern Tato, the real Tato, right? Which is, and it's a 12 pack as well, which would probably be gone by Thursday. I'll be honest with you by the time of next in about two, three days, right? He's brought Southern Tato and he's also brought tablecloths of Tato. Look at this. You do, where's, where's all the Northern Irish guests? Where are all the gifts, huh? Look at that. Look at that. That'll actually look great on the wall. <laughs> that will actually look great on the wall here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this up in the par- Cork and in our podcast studio. Danny O'Brien, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for bringing all the stuff. How are you, Danny? No worries at all. Thanks for being here, Cork and in our... <clears throat> So what made you bring the tater up to me? I, I Did you was... think I was missing home or something? <laughs> yeah, I was gigging in Cork last weekend and then I was thinking about this podcast and then I was literally going past a little bookshop beside where I live in Dublin. Yeah. And I was like, I'll pick up some uh, some Fenian Tato. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we like here, don't we? We like the Fenian stuff. We don't. We, all Tatoes are King Crisps are fine, and Walkers. We accept Walkers as you well. You can draw your like Jubilee cup <laughs> with the Fenian. With yeah, the, with yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> just have the Irish Tato and then just pictures of Michael Collins, Eva De Valera <laughs> up here, just to piss off the uh, the people up here. Danny, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming up on Cork in the North, uh, man. I've worked with many times, ladies and gentlemen, doing stand up across the UK, Ireland. A uh, few festivals and stuff like that, like down throughout the years and stuff like that. You're on tour at the moment. Oh yeah, selling yeah. very well. Yeah, nearly. I'm over the halfway mark. So the show's called Sweet Child O'Brien. So it's a. I, show. Wonder, I wonder where that came from. <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of a, a show like based around your your same same age as me. I uh, growing up in the 80s and 90s in Ireland yeah. and that kind of childhood nostalgia and when parenting was more of a suggestion than a, yeah, 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 <laughs> than, yeah, yeah. A, than a job. And yeah, it's been a lot of fun and the fringe was great. Like, you know, the fringe is what gets your show into shape. Yeah. And then the one thing you don't need to worry about on the tour is the show because you've kind of got it tight at the festival. Yeah. But yeah, it's been great crack and Liberty Hall sold out in Dublin. So I filmed a special at That's that. That's brilliant, man. I was delighted to get that done. That was... Um, so the special's in the bag? The special's in the bag and it's going to be released in the next couple of weeks as well. So yeah, delighted Excellent. about that. Do you, did you film... Did you just do one night, one set camera? Like, this has to work tonight. Yeah, so I did about 15 years of material in one show and it was about 90 minutes all in and it's been edited down to just under an hour. And then there's a ton of bonus clips and stuff as well that will, will leak Excellent. out. Excellent. So it was this uh, 15 years. So is this your whole career? Pretty much all my favourite bits. Because so you, you do your new tour show every year yeah. and it's very rare that you get to just do all the bits that you've loved. From like I think I did my first solo in 2012. So, you know what I mean? There's always a bit from each show that you like. And I was like, I just want to do everything in one go. Wouldn't it be great to have it all in one show rather yeah. than a bit here and a bit there? Yeah, so that, that was the plan. And yeah. I got, I think I forgot one bit, like, but I was happy out with all the rest. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that'll, still, that'll still bug you. Yeah, it'll annoy me now for <laughs> yeah. another, like, 15 years. Yeah, it'll still bug you. Because, um, like, the, the mad thing about it is, is that you're touring. So you went, got the show in the bag at Edinburgh. Yeah. And then, right, okay. Ah, right, okay. So did you do the free in Edinburgh or did you? No, I've, I've been with Scottish. I was with Underbelly for a few years before COVID. That's where I'm going Underbelly this yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. So I was with Underbelly for, I think, four years. 
And then they opened the underbelly. Georgia Square then got that 5 a.m. license and it kind of changed the dynamic of Edinburgh a lot because everyone just kind of stays up at Georgia Square because it has the late license. What used to happen is all the shows would finish. You know yourself, you'd finish late in live. You would go down to the Cowgate. You might be doing Spank or whatever it may be. But now a lot of people tend to just stay up at Georgia Square. So I moved to Scottish Comedy Festival. I think this this would be my third year with them. And it's it's brilliant. It's a It's very much a... It's where comics run the shows, do the shows. It's all, it's a bit of a community. Like, so it's right. predominantly Scottish, Irish and English comics and a few other visiting acts. And then um, like I was there, Glenn Wool was there, um, Gary Little, Ray Mearns, Stu Mitchell. So you're just in one venue? Yeah, I, I do the solo in the Beehive and then I have another show that I do with Rory O'Hanlon, which is part of the Free Fringe, which is called Afternoon Delight, which we have been doing for over a decade. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, so that that's on. And then- There's my, just the two of you? Yeah, and then we have a guest international acts. We usually get like a Canadian American. Wow, never been invited on. Well, that's because you're Irish. <laughs> never been invited on. We 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 go kind of <laughs> we go racist yeah. against our own. Uh, <laughs> Only joking. It'd be an overkill. Um, um, can I? So I got booked. You might know this because you know the underbelly quite well. Yeah, yeah. I've never done the underbelly. I've always done uh, the assembly. Yeah. Um, do you know a room in the underbody called a quad? I do. What's it med, like? med quad, isn't it? Yeah, what's it like? Yeah, yeah, it's nice. And that's up exactly where I just mentioned. That's my room. Very, very busy part of it. Yes! So you should be all right. I'm, yeah, only, yeah. I'm only doing 11 days. Ah, uh, you should blitz that. No bother. I'm doing 11 days, 70 seats. I'm always jealous. I think I think Mickey Bartlett might have done that room. Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing the first, I'm doing the 31st to the 11th and I'm out. I'm yeah. gone. And that's I'm on, dream. I start my tour on the 3rd of September. Yeah, you need a bit so of So I'm going for time. 11 days to tighten the tour. To yeah. do, I can't do the full month because yeah. I've got radio commitments. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'll go for 11 days. That's and I love way. it because I'm like, I'm going home on Sunday. Yeah. Rather than like, oh shit, I have two yeah. weeks left. Yeah, it's too long. It's They're too like, long. It's too long, man. Three and a half weeks. So I'm doing another show with Billy Kirkwood, Scottish comic, yeah. and Rick Molland. So we were always doing comp shows, whether you're doing Best of Irish, the lads be doing Best of Scottish, Pick of the Fringe. And we said, well, why don't we just do a split show between us? that we do every day, that yeah. we're together. So we put on uh, Englishman, Irishman, Scotsman in um, Edinburgh and it's sold out the run. And it's just a good crack show, three comics, 45 minutes. Uh, Billy does like a lip sync dance thing at the end, gets everyone up having the crack. And now that has now nearly sold out Glasgow Comedy Festival. And then it's going back for another full run and we're bringing it to Prague and a few other places as well. Oh, a, few, a few military <coughs> places as well. A few military places. Yeah, yeah. in East Belfast, so. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. <laughs> You should do it out there yeah. for the crack. You'll actually, actually be near my house. That'd be a good preview. Yeah, we'll stay with you. <laughs> no, 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 you won't. <laughs> There's no way. I would be over in a barracks. Uh, I live near a barracks, you see. Wow. British barracks. And do you know what's strange about, li thing about living up here? And I want to talk to you a little bit about your relationship with this place. Because right? I do often like I do like to engage the southern people when they come up because I'm a big fan of the north. Yeah. Didn't think I ever would be. You know, like it was yeah, always yeah. a bit like that, right? I, I don't know. And Sean, now Sean is, yeah, Sean is, Sean, Sean is from the West now. Like right. Sean's, Sean's, Sean's a, Sean's a McDonald's. Sean's, West side. Sean's, Sean's, Sean sleeps in the fucking tricolour. Like, <laughs> oh <my>. right. <laughs> oh you know I mean? Sean, Sean has a baby due in April, like, <laughs> and the child is called fucking De Valera before the child <laughs> yeah. is even born. Going on, Kukola, no <laughs> hair. On, Kukola. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like all the fathers. <laughs> oh, it's kind of every la yeah. every letter has Short, a father. Whatever letter can be fathered, they're all just put together. <laughs> What's the child called? Father. <laughs> <laughs> The child is just called father. That'd be amazing. And it's not even, it's just a symbol. Like yeah, Prince, yeah, it's yeah. just a father. The photograph on his passport would be just of a harp. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the artist formerly known as his father. father. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be the most Irish child born ever. In the world. But I, strange thing about living up here, right, is um, because obviously like 99% of things up here are perfectly fine, right? Yeah. But one day, and I Sean, and you will see this as well, and mm -hmm. I would just think, I would have loved to have seen somebody from Cork see this or somebody from Dublin see this, but I was driving down to Tesco, just a normal Wednesday afternoon, right? Kids are in school. And there's two army trucks driving in front of me with just covered in British flags. And there's just people in the truck. And I'm like, that's the British army. That's weird. And I was just like, like, what the <laughs> fuck? Oh, you, you drive three streets down the road, it's covered in Irish flags. Yeah, it's, it's like you're meant to be impartial. I was just, like, you know what I mean. Like, did you, did you ever see the ones with the British flags at the back of them? Yeah, no, I was no, just no. like, I'd never seen it my whole life. Three years here, I'd never seen it. I went, oh Jesus, it's a bit of overkill. Just thought, like, how? Like, my thing is, I always think to myself, like, I'm used to it now. Yeah, you know, in terms of, but I always thought, like, I know somebody from Cork 
and I won't name them because they do watch the podcast, is that uh, they refuse to come to the north. Really? Completely refuse to come like... there. What was your, what, when you were growing up as a kid, like yeah. me, you like me, I'm the same age, yeah. right? What was your uh, upbringing like in terms of relation to the north and what you would have heard about this place? I remember vividly, actually, I had a really good pal called Brian when I was growing up and his dad was gas crack and he used to bring us all around Ireland. Um, him and his stepmom, and I think we were going to Scotland or something, like, you know, for like a weekend, like camping or something. And I remember being in the back of the van. It was a different time. Like, there was no seats. He actually had two aeroplane seats that he got off some fella, right. and both of them in the back of the van. So we would sit facing the other way with two Alsatians in the back of the van. <laughs> <laughs> I think about that now. It's so ridiculous. But I remember when we first time we drove up to Belfast. I was young, like maybe five, six, and him going. Keep hold a second, hold a second. Let's get this right. You're a five year old yeah. going away with another family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was that? We Who the just, fuck is letting a five year old we go? We were all away? just passed around like joints as kids. Like it was ridiculous. <laughs> like my whole childhood was just one big tiger kidnapping. Like really? no one ever told. But it was, I'd always stay in a mates or a cousins. It was all. What about very... your own folks? I mean, is it different? Were you, were you were you brought up with two parents or? Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, single mom, and then my mom um, had another partner and stuff, but. Like, so I used to get minded by this woman called Nula when I was a kid. It was like a second granny. So her son was kind of like my, and her grandson and me were the exact same age. Oh, right. Okay. So that's kind of why. So they were kind of like family, I suppose. Not non-blood relative family. But uh, yeah, I was just sent off forever. Like I used to not come home for weeks. Don't I'd ever ask any questions or anything like. So you were brought up to Belfast in this Yeah, band. we're going to Scotland and I must have obviously been getting the, the ferry over uh, to Strand Rare. And uh, I remember being in the back of the van. I remember his old lad was mad into the army and he was winding us up and he's like, stay down, lads. You know, there's snipers up here. And I remember we were like, and to be honest with you, he probably was right. Because it would have only been like early 90s, like, you know. Yeah, it's it's a strange one, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know what? A couple of weeks ago, I was winding up Julie, right? Because uh, Julie, only my partner, her, she only got her Irish passport recently. Wow. Right, because she's entitled to two up here. Because I often claim the North is responsible. You know the way now people identify as fucking cats and chickens and microwaves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The North started that. Because when you're born here, you can identify, you can pick your identity. Yeah, yeah. So I have this route. Anyway, so we, we went to the Aviva and she does, Julie loves going down to Dublin or Cork or whatever. Right? And I said, you know, now you have to bring your passport to the Aviva. No and I was way. like, what do you mean? It goes, you, and you can only bring the Irish one, like, because it's an Ireland-Wales game. But if you're in the Irish end, you have to have an Irish passport. Because what do you mean? I goes like, like if they if they know that you're like British, like you won't you won't get into the game. She goes, I'm not British. I'm Northern Irish. I goes, but it's the same thing, isn't it? Like I know, and I'm just winding up. So the morning of the match, she actually would have gone. I've got my passport. Well, I'm only joking with you. Like you don't know, need your passport. Like, <laughs> but like it's amazing what people can think. Yeah. Like like you know because when I was growing up, I used to see it on the news. You know, Morning Ireland six one. Yeah usual shit like and you're like 16, 17 in Cork going to school going fucking nutters up there like yeah you thought it was it was like um, the, the, the phrase you'd always hear as well particularly up uh, around Monaghan and Cavan you know, I saw us here the term banda country yeah that South Arma yeah 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 uh, I actually, this is very oh, so random. Sean calls it a great holiday destination. Yeah. <laughs> Malabon. Great. I, my, uh, every Christmas. A very good friend of mine uh, called Phoenix, Venezuelan fella, and his partner Cormac had the first same-sex marriage in South Armagh and I was there. Really? Yeah, I was at that. When was that? Oh, it was before the pandemic. It wasn't too long. It was maybe a year or two after um, the uh, gay marriage referendum had passed in Ireland. Right. And I remember going there. I can't remember the ven venue. It was kind of like a community centre, but I'll tell you this, and I'm sure some of your listeners will know exactly where I'm talking about. There was a statue of Kukulad out the back with like all like yeah. names of the... Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, that is a Mullivan. Yeah, it's there, yeah. there. That's, what, that's where the wedding see, was. See what the sad thing is? Like, see when I... When you say holiday destination, genuinely, I'm being serious. That's where we used to go on holiday. I was Every at the most year. flamboyant, and it was so weird because it was all... Like Irish Catholics, there was, there was a couple of Protestants there as well, obviously. But there was loads of Central American and South American, like Venezuelans, like. And I think the most awkward thing about the whole thing was how Irish people were looking at the Venezuelans dancing, going, "Oh God, are we going to live yeah. up to this?" And was it? Well, that was quite an interesting wedding to go to. So your he's, buddy Cormac, he's from there. Isn't he's he? from there, and he wanted to kind of make a point that the North is moving forward, and it was it was definitely the first one there. I know that for a yeah. fact. I remember doing material about it. And uh, I was in the fringe actually that year. I think the wedding was in June or July. And I had material about being down at a Ku Cullen statue with a load of Venezuelans. And I'm like, 
this is weird. This is a weird thing yeah, to be yeah. in. And I don't know what I said, but I said something about snipers in the hills and a fella come up to me after the show and leaned into me really ominously, big English fella and just goes, oh, it's one of those snipers. Oh, and wow. walked off and not in a good crack way either. And I remember just going, Ugh. oh, he was, <laughs> he spent time in the old, uh, yeah. the armed forces. The hills here. of eyes. The, oh, Jesus. <laughs> but like, the thing about it, what, being up here is like we only got a government what three weeks ago, Sean. Yeah. Up the north well, here, right? And you kind of go, and as soon as we then you go, oh, finally, great. And next thing they started announcing money for roads and all this kind of stuff. And you think to yourself, it's not that difficult to make one point nine million people work. It's not that difficult yeah. to govern one point nine million people. And uh, I was watching this thing the other day, like they interviewed a lot of people from Dublin. They were like, uh, on Joe they said like, oh, would you like United Ireland or something like that? Like, and then some of them were like, yeah, yeah. And the rest were like, nah, nah, we hate it. And I was just like, oh God, you know, I think, I think like from somebody that's living up here, I, I always just go, just, just, just fucking park all that shit and just get on yeah. with day to day life. I'm, I'm like, very much in the same boat in that respect as well. But <laughs> with like the, it's, it's such a mess, like, because from, from my perspective as well, the UK like the the flags on the on the PSNI vans is the perfect example. You can't claim like ownership. This is England. This yeah. is England, and then be like, well, things aren't working out. You can have it. No one wants that either. That's not fair. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't have it both ways. No matter what you do here, it's wrong. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Likewise, I've seen way too many South Dublin Irish rugby fans that put me off. Uh, an All Ireland. Yeah, <laughs> like, like oh, 100%. like oh man, I was at the Viva, right? Like, and have you uh, been to Longford? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ross Common, Jesus um, Christ! We were at the Viva watching the match, right? Ireland Wales, and this guy. And now, like, I, I wanted to ask you this question. I live Do, inside the Viva, by the way. You right. can park mine anytime you want. Right. We we actually walk. We were going in the gate where the Kin House is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah right. Now, when I and I and I, I want to ask you this question, right? There was a guy behind us at the match. And the game is on and it's all going great and blah, blah, blah. And then all you hear is in the background, defence, come on, oh. come on, up, high line, high line. And he's shouting and shouting and shouting and shouting. And you're like going, oh, he'll eventually calm down. Like, <laughs> nah. It just went and went and went. And somebody behind me, a woman, turned around to him because he was like three rows behind us and said, would you mind stop shouting? She goes, no, she goes, I love your passion. Would you mind stop shouting? You could burst my eardrum. And she started laughing and he started laughing. And he did it, she did it in a very friendly way, right? Yeah. He actually got louder then. Ah, stop. Right? The now, arrogance of that. Now, I want to know this. Do you think that the D4 guys, do they know how much they're getting the shit ripped out of them? I think there's a massive lack of awareness when it comes to any kind of, dare I say it, arrogant, privileged part of any society. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. Whether it's in the UK or in Ireland. And... Unfortunately, if you're brought up with privilege and you can be privately educated, they just, they don't have any social awareness because they're living in that bubble. Yeah. And it's the same way that premiership footballers can sometimes behave like complete and utter pricks because they're always surrounded by other premiership footballers and they're not living in a reality. But like a fair play to that woman for being yeah. so... Uh, but he, he he got worse till the end of the game. Yeah, well, that's that's horrible. And I've, I've been that soldier on it. I've been on that on a flight and I'm always trying to be diplomatic with people and just be like, stop ruining my fucking day with your shit personality. Yeah. <laughs> like, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all. I'm like, do whatever you want, be whatever you want. And like re really nice tactful way from her as well, by the way, yeah. saying I love your passion. I'm like, there's just no need for it, man. So maybe we're all getting a bit old. And like, when I was 18, I remember being on a flight to Corfu with my mates and we were bananas. We had pints at the airport. I remember a woman leaving, leaning over to us going, lads, calm down. And we were a bit like, Ugh. but she was right. We were being little assholes yeah. and we were being obnoxious and you learn from that. But uh, I hate that. I just, I hate people wrecking other people's time. Like she's as entitled to have a good time as he is. And anyone who does that as well, he's the classic... You know, if it wasn't for a couple of knee injuries, I, you know, I could have turned yeah. pro myself. And he's obviously insecure about where his life is. So he has to try and project that by, I am the ultimate super fan. Yeah. Can't stand it. That he, do you know what? And when I turned around and looked at him, I knew exactly what he looked like before yeah, I saw him. 100%. He had the barber jacket, oh, the yeah. shirt open. Yeah. Come on, Ireland. Yeah. Come on, Ireland. I mean, you know, like that kind of thing. Attention like. is a drug and everyone will do what they can to get it. And people, that's obviously whatever his insecurities are in his life, that's his way of 
somehow getting attention onto himself. I, I hate it. And like we talk for a living on stage. Like, yeah. you know, there's narcissism with us when we're on stage. But It's different. It's very light stuff. But it's a di- <laughs> yeah. But like, that's a different scenario. People are yeah. there for that. That woman's not there for that with him. But it, it got to the point where it was really annoying. And the thing is, I'm fully aware as being somebody from Cork, right, that a lot of people take the, think, you know, they say, oh, they're from Cork, so they probably think they're the greatest people in the world, yeah. right? I'm fully aware of that. Yeah, I'm fully yeah. aware of the whole, the independent Republic of Cork. Like, you go to you meet someone from Cork, like, well, I'm from Cork, so like, I'm better. And you know, I find that a lot, a lot of fine. that's tongue in cheek. Yeah, right, I'm you know? totally fine with all that, right? But there's a lot of videos that go around on socials about the D4 people, right? Yeah. Now, I don't know if you saw this one. Um, it was a guy, he was like, uh, they're on a skiing trip or something. It's like, hey, Raj, guys, me, we were there last night and we uh, we tied the lads up and, uh, oh, God, some some absolute belting crack lads. Oh. And uh, I really think we need to do it next year as well. You know? And uh, and then you're like, I thought it was an actual parody. No. Like, I thought it was a piss take. And then I found out that it was actually, like, this was actually, but I'm just curious because you're, you're, you're from there. Yeah. They must know. I, I grew up in Wicklow that, and I, piss I, taken out I, I live in D4. I go to the gym in D4, but I'm more, more kind of attached to Rings End D4. <laughs> like that's yeah, where yeah. I go for pints and have the crack. Like, you know, if you go to Kylie's at Donnybrook, you know, we're going down for a couple of POH and KODs. There's all that. And <laughs> I used to read all the Russell Carroll Kelly books when I was in my 20s because I found them absolutely hilarious. But they were so funny because it's exactly what you said their reality is always more it's like the the voice note that went around with the lads and Kaus and Nui yeah, yeah. absolutely sending it like that that, that was it that was yeah. everything yeah, that was I want to take a knee with embarrassment when yeah. I hear that I don't know is there a Corkonian equivalent because I, I'm trying to think like I mean there's posh parts of Cork alright like you probably think of places like maybe Rochestown mm. uh, but is there that it. genre of person in Cork I actually to be honest with you, there probably is, but I haven't seen it. I haven't either. Yeah. And it's it's very attached to the schools, rugby, you know, whether you've got your Gonzaga, mm. your Blackrock College or whatever it may be. And I've taught workshops in those schools. And like I went to a really rough tech in Wicklow, a gas school where you couldn't play any rugby or anything yeah. like that. And like I went to school with farmers. Everyone was working class. Everyone's parents worked. There was no real privilege. Like, you know what I mean? So I always found it very weird when I'm in these like Hogwarts schools and the lads have their own bank cards and, they're just living in a different world, but it is, it is, it can be very difficult for people to be around. It can be pretty. It, I, fi- I, and I And I had an incident with them as well, mm-hmm. right? I was on a stag do in Westport. and Great place for a stag. Right. And the, the groom was from Cork. So there's six or seven of us from Cork. But then the brothers, brother-in-laws were coming from Dublin that he yeah. was marrying into that kind of family. like, And they were, they were everything they were going to be. And I, I was like, fair, I'm sure they're nice lads. Like, I'm Damo and Ivor, like, like color up. But uh, Leinster were playing. Yeah. That night, right? And um, they were watching it. And the way they spoke to you was just different. Yeah. Right? You know, they're like, so what are you doing, Andrew? Yeah. And I went, oh, I'm a comedian. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. And is that full time? Like, Oh, yeah. That's that's my favourite. Right? And then I'd say to them, what are you doing? Lo- we're, 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 we're both solicitors. I'm like, of course, a fucking course you yeah. are. Of yeah. course you're a solicitor. Do you work for your dad's firm? Of course you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, at the wedding, which was about uh, three months later, then I bump into one of them in the toilet. They weren't our cup of tea. They were nice fellas. Like. Yeah. And then one, as he was washing his hand, you're not going to believe it. Like, but he just turned and he goes, do you still do the comedy thing? And I just went, fuck. I yeah. just went, nah, I gave it up, man. <laughs> it's such, I was just like, I can't talk to you, man. It's it's such an obnoxious thing to do. And like, like you've had, you, you I think you worked in finance, didn't you, when you yeah, first started a bit, comedy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I used to be a social care worker. I've always worked in real jobs. I double jobs yeah. for years before I was able to do comedy full time. Yeah. It took, and we're all, there is no, you're either doing podcasts, you do radio, I do events, I have a comedy club. You have to do a multitude of different things. Like the only time you could really make a living as a comic was probably in the early 90s, you know, in the UK, not in Ireland, you know what I mean? Um, Yeah, I just, I find that really ignorant. Like any job can be a career. A yoga teacher can own a series of yoga businesses, you know what I mean? A a barista can own a series of coffee shops. So it's just, it's just that I always, I always wanted to ask, because we don't get a lot of people from Dublin out here. I always said, I really want to. Do you do they are you are they aware of the fact that people are ripping the arse out? They they are probably, but I don't think they care. Yeah. They're living in a bubble. Do you know what I mean? Like if you if you want it Searson's if you want to do a little bit of uh, people watching and you know, I don't know if your if your immune system would be able to take this now, but I'd go watch a Leinster match in Kylie's of Donnybrook or what in Searson's in Baggett Street. 
and it's just it's, it's, it's unreal it's salmon it? jumpers on shoulders it's lunch dear. like you yeah, know yeah, it's yeah. just like kpmg yeah, guys stop it's yeah i and uh, do you know what's ironic i actually I, was, yeah. I know a few of the leinster lads that, uh, that i've met at different gigs and stuff that we've done over the years their sound and I know a few of the Connacht players as well. They're yeah. all the players themselves are all bang on. They're not like that at not all. Not at all, man. And it's it's very funny that their their most passionate followers are and it's the same though, like you know, GAA is like that as well. You go onto the hill, the hill is full on, man. You watch a game on the hill with dubs fans, like it's bananas. They're screaming at a different level, but it's it's the same crack, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's crazy, isn't mm. it? So, Danny, you've been doing comedy about 15, 16 years? Yeah, now, about that, like that, yeah. Yeah, and you've done a lot of stuff outside of Ireland. You do a lot in Australia. You've, gone, yeah. you've done all those tours and stuff like that. Is there, like, like a, the way you've built up your audience now yourself, your solo audience and stuff like that, um, and you do the, your, the corporate stuff, like, what is the kind of, like, route now for you, do you think, that, you're, that you enjoy doing the most? Is it the live the festivals do the Australia once a year the Edinburgh's do my tour in Ireland go over to the UK then re- copy paste and repeat yeah that, that's is, is exactly that basically it. or do you have like do you really want to grow this sort of going into businesses and helping people develop their skills public speaking and stuff yeah I'm, I'm, I'm trying to grow both actually kind of symbiotically at the same time do you know what I mean so I do a ton of skill workshops and stuff. I've actually done a lot of work with the prisons in Ireland. I was what are you on, doing in the prisons? I did the first ever kind of uh, confidence building and public speaking through the medium of comedy workshops in a maximum security prison. Which prison? So uh, Midlands. Port Leash. Port Leash. Right. Where, which has a, a full IRA wing. A full Still, IRA wing. Sean, IRA did you know anything about that? Do you know about oh, yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> this this is I, I, I didn't I, I didn't realize um how full on it was. So if you have a CO officer of each wing, whatever the wing is, A wing, G wing, whatever MD, it may be. The MD. Pretty much, but in the that particular wing in, in Port Leash, um the CO is actually an inmate who is uh a former member of the of the IRA. So if you have an issue on that particular wing, it is nearly all Irish speaking as well, which is another thing. Wow. And you have to report to them if you have an issue. So if you have an issue with your cellmate or whatever it may be. So instead of going to an actual prison officer, they have a, a delegated um internal Fair play to them. Do you know how to sort do know how to yeah, solve things? It's, like? Well it's it's seen as a political wing, you know, and it's yeah. And an interesting fact about Port Leash as well, it is actually the most secure prison in Europe because of the IRA, because they made a couple of attempts to bomb people out of it. So the way it's built, it is it is the most impenetrable place you've ever been in your life. So it's quite like, well secure. What yeah. was it like? So how first of all, how do you get in there? Like like in terms so, of like, how did you get the gig? Like how, they must have done some serious checks with you. Yeah. So initially, I did a lot of stuff with John Caleri. So we yeah. did stuff in Mount Joy through the Bohemians Foundation, more centered around mental health week. So then I did stuff in Wheatfield, and then I did stuff for Mental Health Week in um, in Port Leash itself. And then we were back in after COVID, myself and Carol Spain, actually, we did a work, we did a comedy show, kind of light workshop, but the setup was insane. It was in a, a like a basketball court. So there's like 40 prisoners, probably 40 officers, one big lead speaker. So the sound and acoustics were atrocious, like did it. And then the officer in charge at the time got in touch and she said, would you be willing to do a six week workshop with our inmates? I had to put a proposal in. I was in New Zealand on tour at the time and I was doing all of this. So it was a bit of a nightmare, you know what I mean? Time difference wise. So I was up like really late at night in New Zealand getting this over. But it took months to get across the line. So it was finally accepted. So do you know, like, did you see anyone in Port Leash that, I we, did. Would, that, I, we, that I, we would know? I did. I saw some of the highest profile uh, Gilligan? Irish gangsters. Did you see Gilligan? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I, I saw someone that would be of that level as well. And I saw a, a couple of murderers that were, um, they just passed me as they were going into like a computer class. So it's, it's, it's very intense, you know. Um, just, I did, and they just as normal as anyone else. Just as normal. Like, well, like, you know what I mean? Like humans are humans. Like, you know, it's not. It how, must be, it must be like when you're walking around that prison, like how daunting is it to be like, oh shit, this is people's it, life. It's a little bit, when you go into the center bit and you're looking at all the different wings looking at you, that can be, but there's, there's people coming in and out all the time for education. But uh, I think one of my favorite things, they actually have a podcast studio, right? So the section where we were doing the workshops every, every week for six weeks, they have a former barbers. So they were teaching people how to be a barber. 
uh, but the barbershop name was like sprayed up and everything, but it's called Con Hair. <laughs> 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 so Con Hair is now a podcast studio. Con Hair podcast. Con Hair is now a podcast studio and they have an internal radio Con within Air. the prison. And the lads that we worked with, there was eight of them in total and then one actually got out early. And uh, But we got them from, uh, nearly all of them were in there for addiction related crimes, thefts, burglaries, that kind of thing. So we weren't working with any 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 sex offenders in the, or anything in that, the in that high, high level category A's kind of thing. But they were all category A oh, because sorry. of where we were oh, in the right. prison. Like so, they're all kind of high category prisoners. But um, a lot of these lads, I used to be a social care worker. I used to work in the homeless and addiction services. So I had worked with lads like this for years. Nearly all of my clients had been in prison. And uh, I'm a big believer that you can people have an opportunity to change if they want to put the work in, mm. you know. So these lads went from not even being able to make eye contact with you, like if they were sitting on the couch beside me and you were talking to them, they'd just be, you know, they couldn't. Um, and we Why went. Why is from, that? Do you think? Uh, just shame, shame, a uh, shame. One thing, really, the reason I did the workshops actually, I was in Wheatfield Prison with John Caleri and. We were talking to the lads and we said, what's your biggest anxiety when getting out? And one of the lads said, I'm going to a wedding in a few weeks and I'm thinking about reoffending in here so I don't have to go to the wedding because I don't know what to say to people. Do you get what I mean? So people would ask them, like those lads said to you, still doing the comedy? People go, were you in prison? And the shame of that for him is overwhelming. Like if you have been locked up for three, four years and people say, what do you do yourself? What do you say? Oh, so, yeah. Do you get what I mean? So... Mm. I thought that was kind of a bit harrowing, to be honest with you. And Imagine having to want to re-offend just to yeah. avoid. Yeah, avoid yeah. and he was dead serious. He wasn't joking. And then when we did the workshops with the lads, they went from most of them not even being able to look at us and just awkward and just, you know, to them getting up and doing a stand-up set. And that took a lot of work. So I had Willow White in there with me, who's a, an ex-prisoner yeah. himself, John Caleri, Carl Spain. And it was class. And I, I'll be honest, it's most... It, the most transformative bit of work and the proudest bit of work I think I did last year forget about the tours the festivals the gigs telly any mm. of that crack I loved seeing someone who could barely look at the floor getting up and telling a little funny story do you know what I mean and mm. like some of them were gas man like one of the lads got arrested for robbing a dog because he tried to mug someone I just didn't have money so he robbed her dog and like just madness like and it's all like in the in the blitz of addiction and craziness but uh some of them have some stories that are just, they're mind-blowing. Like I actually would say world. that if you actually spoke to a lot of people in prison and they told you, if, if you, you know, if they wrote their life down on a piece of paper yeah. and you just read it, you'd be like, that didn't happen. Like, you'd actually, you, you never believed the stuff they did. Like, like. One, of the, one of the clients had been, one of the prisoners, he'd been using heroin since he was 13 and he was now 37. And I'm actually so impressed that someone's even made it to that age with all the stuff that would have gone on in those years. And he was really willing to change. He was getting his um, methadone down. And I, I just find it fascinating. And I just, I, the Irish prison system's completely broken. Uh, we've got one of our main judges in Dublin, the sex offenders, there is no more room. So they keep putting them on suspended sentences, which I have a massive issue with. You know, there's people going to jail for getting six year sentences for money laundering and getting no sentence for, for raping someone like that is absolutely, yeah. I, I cannot, yeah. it really, really bothers me, that kind of stuff. So I'm like, build another prison. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that is going to hurt society. So build another prison. This system isn't working and the prison officers will be the first ones to tell you that as well. Yeah, their hands are tied. Um, but, when you went in, were you scared? No, I'd, I'd been in them quite a lot and it's always a little bit nervous. Like I was in Mount Joy on last Monday. That was surreal. I'd love to go to Do you Mount know Joy. who was in front? I don't know if I can say this, but uh, when I was going into Mount Joy, uh, there was a prisoner signing in. It was uh, oh, that's fine. Don't have to say it if you want to. Say. Yeah, well, well, Enoch Burke has had to oh, sign in. Oh, is he still and fucking? He, he was, was he a, there. He was in front of me in the queue going through. I was like, I know him. <laughs> and then I was like, you know, when you don't connect, I was like, yeah. maybe went to school with him because he was so well dressed. He looked like a solicitor. So was he? Was he in a suit every day in the? Prison? Yeah. So he, I, I think he's on like day release. So he's. I think he has to go in and sign in to Mount Joy because he was going in when I was coming in. He was coming out when I was coming out. So he would have been in there for a couple of hours. So I would assume he has to do that once a week or once a month or whatever. And was he polite to the staff? Completely. I've never seen anyone more composed or polite in my life going into anything. This story's been going on for about six, eight months now. Yeah, mad. The Enoch book story. story. Yeah. School teacher, issue with a child over pronouns, ended up getting suspended, disciplinary, sacked him, kept on turning up to the school. Yeah. Was told not to turn up to the school. If he keeps turning up to school, he's going to go to prison. Ends up going to prison. 
has a go at the judge. The family has a go at the judge. The, the judge family like, get kicked out of the, the court. Get kicked out of the court. They all get charged. He ends up going to prison. Then they say to him, look, you don't have to be in prison if you just say you're not going to go to the school while this thing is going on. He's like, no, I'm going to go to the school. So they put him back in fucking prison. And he's now been in prison for like, what, 200 days? you got to admire the tenacity. Oh, his commitment. <laughs> commitment. To, his commitment to gender. Yeah. And to, to, he and she is phenomenal. Like, I don't know the ins and outs of the case, so I'm not going to kind of he refused comment. To, he refused to acknowledge the students' pronouns. That's, oh, that's, right, that's okay. how the whole thing started. That he, he refused to acknowledge. Okay. Yeah. Well... I'm not getting involved in that debate, right? Like, but, but can you imagine in 10 years' time, like, he's in there? And it's he, mental, because I was doing a gig in Mayo that week, and I brought it up that I was in going into prison, and everyone, half the crowd booed, but half them cheered. <laughs> he's, a, he's weird. He's very, mar- he's very Marmite character. You know? He's got to the point where people are like, your man's mental. Yeah. This is hilarious. Yeah. So it's gone from, this is actually quite a serious issue in modern Ireland, yeah. right? To now being... Ah, fucking, your man's still in there. That's some crack, isn't it? Like, they were all, I think the family, the family are quite intense, like, yeah. there, because some of the family were with him on the way in, and, like, I think they were all, like, homeschooled and stuff, and they, I think they have quite strong religious beliefs and stuff. It's just quite rare. It's just a, quite a rare thing in 2024. But that family is now notorious across Ireland. And if yeah. you think about it, they're all unemployable. Yeah. Because if you think, if you think... Or extremely you employable. Enoch, can you imagine <laughs> yeah. Enoch Burke coming out of prison? And he goes, right, I need to get an actual job now. And he puts yeah. an application into some school in Mullingar or Westmead or Dublin or yeah. whatever. And they, they go, Enoch Burke, no fucking chance. I think he should become an influencer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think he should do an OnlyFans. <laughs> yeah, I'm like outside of school in Mullingar, follow for more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it's just like him, like, going, to, like, I don't know, like, I think people would pay to see a day in the life of Enoch Burke. I'm fascinated by it. Do you know what will happen? Uh, Louis Theroux will probably end up doing a documentary on him. Yeah. Something like that. Somebody needs to go. What's that woman that goes and stays He'd over? He'd be a great him? podcast guest, I'm just saying. Do you know, what, what, what are they, what are they, what's the one that does that she stays over with all the people in Ireland? Oh, yeah. Black haired girl. Yeah, li- living with uh, Lucy. Lucy. Yeah, living with Lucy. Do you know what? Uh, one of the funniest things to happen in Ireland that I have to say was, or I think it was around Christmas time last year. I don't know if you saw this. A stag party in Sligo dressed the stag up as Enoch Burke and made him stand outside all the pubs. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. So he wasn't allowed to go in. Yeah, he had to just stand outside. It was class, and it was like freezing winter, and they had the glasses and the jacket on him, and everything it was hilarious. So it's gone like from a being a serious issue to people like is this still yeah. shit going like you yeah. know what I mean like, you, you, you had to feel bad for like the, the student you know where it was all started over yeah place, do you know what I mean man no if the student came out and went oh I'm actually I'm actually a he now so yeah, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean I'm actually uh, my pronouns are he him so it's it, uh, like you know, like in Anchorman, you see that meme all the time and it says, well, that escalated quickly. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, has yeah, to be really. the greatest escalation Relation. in the history yeah. of the what Irish a, state. What a stupid hell to die on, like. Yeah. From him. I, I just, I just feel like, man, you but only wait, go, is this the, like, exactly, is this the hill you want to die on? But like, when you have beliefs and you're a strong character, mm. it's very hard for And your those, family are exceptionally strong characters. It's very hard for those people to shake, to, to move from their their position but he can't stand down now now he can't you know sometimes when you go too far with any point you can't backtrack even if you well, don't particularly believe it yourself like he doesn't even believe in the courts now doesn't he like, yeah. like he's like so like the family aren't allowed in they're all under prosecution for, <laughs> just for a contempt zoom in, like. Uh, like and it's gonna it's, where is this going to end are they all going to end up in a fucking killing field or something like that like or, or like you could be you know what happened now in about two years time he's going to be going into a workshop in Portleach prison in the IRA wing and Enoch Burke is head of the IRA wing yeah. or something like that I would you know? love to see Kilty interview him on the late like, yeah, yeah. imagine like it's like a Christmas or like a special that would be absolutely amazing yeah. no, is he, surprise the, surprise the, the, <laughs> the, the welcome him into the studio but he's not there and then there's like a camera outside and he's just waiting outside yeah, 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 yeah. studios but he's obviously a man of principle yeah. whether you agree or disagree you have to admire yeah. the absolute balls yeah and look, Mount, I'll tell you what, man. Mountjoy is not is not a nice environment. I've I've gigged, I've gigged in every prison. In What's Ireland. it like doing a gig in there? Surreal. Like so, there's lads smoking in the room with you of questionable substances, and like when's the so last all, time? Like what do you mean? They, they sometimes smoke in the room that you're in, and I I haven't been standing beside someone like weed, like well, whatever it was. Yeah, and the officers are there. Well, there was this is more education, but they're they can't really stop that kind of thing as well. Do you know what I mean? It's more hassle than it's worth. And uh, I've I've had a really in in three separate prisons, I've taken the piss out of prisoners just for whatever. And they've turned out to be three of the most serious offenders that they have in there. 
Like, personally, I have taken the piss out of two murderers and thank God it went well because I'd just be thinking about that for the rest of my wow. life. And what's that like when you go on and go, how does it work? Like, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host. Like, or how So, yeah, done? so like, I always chat to them on the way in. I always, I hate that us versus them thing. And it's like with a corporate as well. If you kind of go and speak to people before the corporate, hey, how you doing? Is there anyone I should chat to? Anyone I should mention? Just being human with them. Shake their hand on the way in. Hey, you doing, lads? Grab a seat. How you doing? Grab a seat. That is more important than the gig itself. You have to have that human connection with someone. If I stand over in the corner, make eye with, contact with them. If stuff. I stand in the corner with the officer and the lads see There's me, a barrier then. that's us versus them. I'm just one of the officers. Then you have to be. Hey, you doing lads? You having a cup of tea? What's the crack? I remember when we did the gig myself and Carl. There was a fella. He'd never get this in a Dublin prison ever. All the lads are North Face, head to toe. They're all wearing runners. You know, yeah. from, some of them may have been acquired from the riots or whatever. Maybe right. But um, in Port Leash, I remember there was a fella wearing cowboy boots uh, at the front and he was sitting in the front row and we were ripping the piss out of him going, did you get arrested at a Gar Brooks concert? Like, what is this, you know? <laughs> and the lads are like, ah! So they, they love the slagging. They love the slagging amongst each other. And uh, there was an elf in there, like, oh, I'm going to say late 70s. He looked wild, like wild grey hair. And we were like, Jesus Christ. I was like, I said to him, I was like, are you one of the founding members who invented LSD? Because he just looked yeah. like that. And the lads just went nuts. And you know what I mean? And it's... Uh, you're like the the Johnny Cash of Irish comics. Yeah, with no yeah. with no musical <laughs> no musical talent. Actually, when we did a we did a gig for lifers. Myself and John Caleri as part of a mental health week, and that was one of the reasons I ended up in the prisons. I'll never forget this. They were predominantly from the Limerick gang kind of time about 20, yeah. 20 years ago. So they'd actually be our age now, so they'd be kind of were eighteen to twenty young when they're for life, like. Life and a lot of them are in there for stuff like a classic example is they might owe 500 quid for weed and this still goes on right now. It's a huge issue in Dublin and they go, okay, you owe 500 quid. I need you to move this bag from here to here and they give them a school bag and they orchestrate the bag to be taken off the young fella why one of their own crew and they say there was 10 grand's worth of drugs in there you now owe us 10 grand so that's a massive extortion thing so there's a lot of parents and stuff getting being forced to go to credit unions for their own kids safety over like minuscule kind of weed that's it it's really horrible so then what happens is and this is the case for a lot of the lads that were in there they say you owe us 10 grand uh, if you want to clear the debt you need to kill someone for me now if your family's poor and you're from a poor part of cork or limerick city and you don't have the money and you're up against the wall they forced then an 18 year old and because they're 18 they're inexperienced they're not hit man they're children and they give them guns and they they execute someone and then they take the full rap for the murder so there's a lot of people in there for that kind of stuff do you get what i mean yeah and it's, it's, it's a vicious circle it's, it's it? really vicious mm. and it's really hard to be around but i remember the, the pa system was terrible so i brought in all my own gear but you have to put it through the security things yeah. like going through the airport like you know but uh, I remember that time with John, the system was shocking, man. I don't know where they got the PA. It was like a karaoke, you know, like a bad gig. Yeah, I know what and you mean. Yeah, it yeah. was like, you know, the, the, when you see a speaker with lights in it, you know, <laughs> you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> and I remember looking in and there was about 32 prisoners and a couple of social care workers and a couple of officers uh, sitting at three rows of tables, a lot of different nationalities, Irish, mainly from like Cork, Limerick and stuff. And one of the lads was playing Wonderwall on a broken guitar and it was murdering it but it was good crack and the officer said I'll stop him playing Wonderwall now and you can do your gig and I'm like don't stop Wonderwall yeah. like imagine like I'm the reason Wonderwall gets stopped you get a box at a house yeah, party yeah, yeah. for doing that so I said let him finish Wonderwall and then we started and then that gave us a nice lead into the gig you know Brilliant. Mm. But like, I've always wanted a gig in a prison. Yeah. I've always wanted to do it, you know. I'll, I'll put and, you uh, forward. I'd love to do it. No, but like, what's what what's it like when you like do material? Like, like, one thing I learned you can't turn around to goes you know when you're on a holiday yeah. oh shit yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. sorry 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 so, you know if you're on a different wing just imagine so that like, keep, you know, like... keep it self-deprecating I did a lot of stuff about growing up and being from Wicklow and I was slagging the Wicklow accent and you know cu- and they're cu- fine with all that kind yeah, of stuff yeah culties versus dubs then it works the other way like when you're in Port Leash it's predominantly country lads very rare you'd have Dublin fellas you'd have there. to be kind of careful with the material wouldn't you absolutely you've got to be very smart about your material and you'll notice yourself all those years of MC and all those tough gigs that's when you really find those muscles because you have to selectively go can't do that can't do that can't say that can't say that I got a little bit too close to that material pull back it's a constant and was any heckling? no not really a couple of lads might talk <coughs> during it but they're all there for the crack like, their days are so mundane and grim 
they're not going to mess it up. Do you get what I mean? They're not going to wreck it. Like, someone would shout out the odd thing, but it's fine. Like, you know, the worst they do is talk. I, I you know, th that prison gig wasn't the worst gig I did that week. <laughs> Put it that way. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but it seems to be bringing in people, bringing in comedians, bringing in performers. And what, in terms of doing these kind of workshops for them, is this for people that are potentially going to be released in terms of, hey, get your confidence up? Get your yeah, bit of, get but like, it's, 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 you're just trying to show them that there's another way. Do you get what I mean? Like, yeah. you don't have to, like, the cycle of, of, of just criminality is just a nightmare. And that's one of the things we were really trying to focus on with the small group I was working with, that you need to work your arse off so you don't end up back in here again. It's just a revolving door for so many of them. And one of the lads made a good point. He goes, when I get out, I've nothing but worries. I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. I've got to pay the rent. I've got to pay the bills. When I'm in here, I go to the gym twice a day. I know what time my meals are at and I don't have any worries. So for a lot of people, inside is a hell of a lot easier than outside. Yeah. And it, they're safe inside. Yeah. If, if you know, I know there's, there's, there's obviously trouble in prison, yeah. but in a way, they know what they're getting. There's a, yeah, a lot, I feel really sorry for a lot of the younger prisoners. There's a hell of a lot of prisoners in protection and you go to protection for two reasons. If you have like told on someone, so if you're a rat or a grass, right. whatever. Fucking or, snitches or get snitches, snitches mate. Yeah. Fucking well, rats, they, mate. Totes, mate. Yeah. Totes get, but totes get it, shot, mate. It's also if they owe a bit of money out and that's, you know, if you have if an addiction, if they owe money out. So if they owe money for weed or, or heroin, so say you owe 500 quid and you can't pay it, they're like, well, then we're going to, we're going to stab you. We're going to, we're going to kill you. And then their only way out of that is going into protection. If they've no family members who will give them the money to do that, they have to go into protection and protection's rough because you're in for 23 hours a day. You only get one. You can't do any of the classes. You can't do any workshops. You can't do any education stuff. You are locked down for 23 so hours. In a, in a cell for... And that's half the prison. If you, if you have a prison that over 90% of it is in addiction, at least half of those in addiction would nearly be in protection because of owing money out. And you know, other there's also gang factions and stuff like that as well. It's it's it very you, grim. It makes you realise like it's know, not the holiday know. camp. People think that the lads are in there playing FIFA. That is not the case. I have never seen that. In Wheatfield, for example, there's not even a cafeteria. You get your you get your food on a tray slid into your door. Well, Wheatfield's quite a strict place, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Wheatfield's grim and they're they're old, like the buildings are old. Like Mount Joy is, is wrecked. Like they had to close down St. Pat's, which was the juvenile part of Mount Joy because it was simply unsafe. You know, it's it's just it's a it's a very it's a very you know, I do a lot of stuff to keep my mental health and you play golf, I'm yeah. sure that's a contributing yeah. factor. I do hiking, uh I go out on my motorbike or whatever, I, I try to meditate, I try to not booze too much. They're all things you're I still do. off the booze. Uh at the moment, yeah. What are you off now? I did I did a hundred days and then I went back on it for maybe a month and then I I What did I, you notice straight away within the month of going back on it? I noticed I was working better and more productive than any time in my life. You went life. back on it? Uh, but no, oh, no, I, All right. on, no, no. I got nothing right. done. I just hung over. I just realised. Do you know what be great now if he goes, yeah, when I went back on it, yeah. man, life is just so no. much easier. It wrecks you, man. You're just there cry wanking. You can barely send an email. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, with the, it's, the lack of productivity from a hangover is spectacular. And when you're not drinking, you're getting tons of stuff yeah. done. That's the that's it. Well, I don't drink in the week because I'm up at five in the morning. Right? Yeah. And I like I was up at five this morning, finished radio at ten. I was in the gym at uh ten past eleven. Yeah. Finished at ten past about quarter past twelve. Home, big lunch, in here for two. Yeah. And I'll be here till half. If you had three pints last night, now you'd be rattled. You oh, but I wouldn't. You couldn't though. do it. So like I know I'm gonna have I'm gonna have about two or three pints on Saturday night because we're doing the comedians darts. Yeah. But I've nothing to do on Sunday. Yeah, so I'll allow myself. But if I if I had to work on Sunday, oh no shit, I I, I work, but it's Sunday night. Yeah, but yeah. three pints would be okay. But I'm not like having to get up at five in the morning or six in the morning. Yeah, I, I can I lie in. I, I can lie in till ten. Like. I don't have the recovery time. I just don't have it. Like if if I go right. out in a mad one, I was out with a musician, a palomine from Newfoundland. It was the night after I did Liberty Hall, so that was on the 27th of January. Had a few points that night. You know when you do a big show though, and your yeah. camera crew, you're managing all the people, and you're saying thanks to everyone afterwards. But then on Sunday, my mate was on tour in Glasgow and they were in Dublin for a night and he's a lunatic. He's a, His name is Mark. He's lead singer of a band called Rum Ragged. If you're into your kind of trad, uh, check these boys out. They're gas crack. Oh, very good. And, um, but me and him went on a little Guinness music walking tour in Dublin and it was it was brilliant. But I, I was written off. I haven't drank since. I haven't drank since the 28th yeah. of January. I didn't drink for uh, 16 months in 2015. Wow. And uh, you notice who your friends are. Yeah. 
Do you know? Do that, you know that's that? very true, man. So I did an experiment uh, a couple of years ago, and I I don't know was it an age thing. I'm, I'm sure you you'll know this, right? Well, I'm talking about friends now, like like in comedy. Comedians all get on, but we don't necessarily see each other. Yeah, that you often, might only right? see each other yeah, once right? or twice a year. But in terms of people away from comedy, I said, I'm just going to not message people. Oh, see yeah. Who messages me. Yeah, it's horrible. Fuck me. I'm going through a bit of that myself at the moment. I very, I, I totally, that resonates a lot. And I, and I was very surprised that, and I, there was a couple of people I went, I've noticed I was always contacting them first. Yes. Hey, man, how are you getting on? Fancy a coffee next week? And they'd reply, bit busy, but I'll be in touch. And then, you know, you know, you might send another message about a football match or something. And then they'd be like, then you'd meet up with them. And then two, three weeks will go by. And you go, oh, I must meet up with so-and-so again. And then you realize, but they're never messaging I, me to meet up with me. I, so then I'm going, <laughs> and I've actually never seen people since, ever yeah. since I did that. I'll tell you, a very good friend of mine, one of my best pals in the UK. Um, he won't mind me mentioning, his name is Mark Gallagher. Right? He's a builder. His father is an Irish builder. His mother is an Irish nurse. So biologically, he's probably more Irish yeah, than you yeah, and me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he looks, he's a big gruff. He looks he's, Irish. He's like, oh, then are you doing? He's a big like cockney yeah. geezer. Like, but he said this to me years ago. Um, he had a Z list, right? That he used to have on his phone. It's exactly what you're talking about. So if he would say to his pal, hey, do you want to go for a coffee? And they said, no he would put a Z beside their name, right? And then if they said it again, if he offered and they said no or they cancelled on him last minute, kind of shitty behaviour, basically, he would kind of give them three chances and he'd put a Z beside their name. And if he got three Zs, it would put them down the very bottom of his phone book in his contacts and then he would delete them. And that was it. Also, so, so say, for example, it was it was Andrew. Yeah. He put Z Andrew, Z yeah. Z A. Yeah. Double two Z A, yeah, triple Z A, and he goes, "Oh, they're out of my life." Yeah, and then when he got to the triple Z, and I, I, I kind of respect it to be honest with you. I brutal, think it's very brutal, but very your posters after coming down there behind you <laughs> must be the ghost of uh, all those friends who never oh, text sorry. you back. Um, Sean, but yeah, well, y you know the phrase like, "Don't water dead plants." I think about that a lot, and the older you get, you're kind of going, you know, you want to, you want to people in your life who are bringing something to the table. I don't mean money or anything like that. I mean, like they're they're making your life better. And if they're not adding to your life, it's what's the point yeah. really keeping them I, in? I've noticed, like, especially over the over the last few years, how great some of my friends are, mm. you know, especially during, like when my mom was ill and stuff like that. Like really, really good friends. And then they would check in with you four or five months after my mom died and they'd be like, I know that, I know everyone's probably stopped mentioning it. That's exactly right. Yeah, That's, yeah, yeah. And it's like four or five months there's a comedian in, uh, in the UK, Danny Danny Ward, lovely fella. He lost his mom when I messaged him. And then I knew his mom, the first Christmas was I know was Danny up. Ward. Yeah, he works at Mark yeah. uh, Simmons. Mark lot. Simmons. And yeah. I messaged him again and said, I know it's your first Christmas, man. Just letting you know. You'll yeah. get through it. Like. But people just go back to their normal lives. And there was a few things that happened. There was when I stopped drinking in 2015 for a year, purely just for the crack. You did a year like, off at the gym? Yeah, I did about 15 months. <clears throat> no actual reason. I noticed that the whole like, hey man, you want to go for a pint on Sunday? I'll stop. People weren't actually interested in like hanging out with me. They yeah. were more interested in me using me to enable them. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly when you're a comic as well. I had a real issue. Was I, I, I was the last electric picnic, the last couple of electric picnics. I, um, I, I didn't drink at them. And I remember a friend of mine's like, come on, come on. And like, really, she was being really over the top. And I said, listen, I'm not an introverted person. I don't need, yeah. to booze to have the crack or dance or go to a, a, a party or rave in the woods or whatever it may be and then I realised exactly what you're saying me being sober highlights their shit behaviour and they don't want you to see them and like that and they don't yeah. want you to say do you know what you did or they want they need you to be as as messed up as they are yeah. to make themselves feel better yeah well if comedy ever doesn't work out for you you should be a psychologist in a prison Danny <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> well it obviously is working out for you like you know what I mean <laughs> Um, Danny O'Brien first time on Cork no, I'll definitely get Danny back on I, I, what's coming up for you Danny where can people find your stuff people wanted to book you for work or what, what, any, what any, anything do? at all I've, my website is dannyobriencomedy.com and then my company website is drumhilleventmanagement.com yeah. that's where we do all the kind of corporate and kind of school prison university workshops this tour is running from now until about the end of April with a couple of little festivals. We've got Glasgow Comedy Festival yeah. in March. And then May, June, July is kind of festivals all over the place. Few European dates. Then I'm climbing Kilimanjaro in July. Wow. And then the new show is called Kiladanjaro. And uh, that is going to be premiering at the Edinburgh Fringe for the in whole month. August. 
whole month, 26 nights. Why the fuck do you do it to yourself? I, do you know what? I do three shows a day. I do one with Rory O'Hanlon. I do a solo. And then I do one with Rick and Billy Kirkwood. Yeah. And I start at about quarter to two. I finish at about quarter to nine. Seven hours. Three shows for three and a half weeks. And I think it's a better way to do it. Because you do like three months work in probably six months work. in uh, Three weeks. But yeah, but the show comes out savage. Yeah. That's the thing. The tour show comes out the same as you. You'll do 11 nights of that and it'll be absolutely... Tight as fuck. Exactly. Tight. Buy a ticket. <laughs> Piece of shit. Anyway. Danny, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Excellent having Danny O'Brien on the podcast. Please do check him out and go see him on him live. Go check his stuff out on YouTube and Instagram and stuff like that. And he'll be, he's obviously be, be up in the north and stuff like that performing. Um, it's really good to get Danny in. Definitely get him back in again soon when he's when he's back up again. Guys, remember the Die In Pub, twenty five percent off your food. Cork twenty five Wednesday to Saturday. Go down, check it out. Sign up to the Patreon exclusive gigs. Access to my tour on sale in a couple of weeks. Tour starts on the third of September in Bangor at the Courthouse. Going to be in the Liberty Hall in Dublin. I'm doing three shows in Cork, all over the north, London, Glasgow, everywhere. Places I didn't even ask to go, but I'm going. And I'm worried now we'll even fucking sell. So help me, help a man out, will you? Azerbaijan. Help, uh, Azerbaijan. <laughs> They've booked me to Prague. Can't even spell it. Anyway, listen, guys, Cork of the North, Danny O'Brien, check it out. All his details are below on the YouTube. I appreciate it, guys. Talk to you soon.